the bishop had some real problems. He'd been sent to take care of one of the most troubled places in all of Christendom. Less than a decade before, the country, Mexico, had been ruled by the most blatantly satanic regime known to history. Only a decade before, this had been a country where, by using a razor-sharp obsidian blade, the still-beating heart of a man was sliced out of his chest and offered up, along with his body and blood, to placate the demonic gods the Aztec worships. This had been a country where, by imperial law, every town with a temple had to offer a minimum of a thousand human sacrifices to just one of the principal demons of their religion to say nothing of the sacrifices that had to be offered to the other demons. This had been a country where specially chosen children were raised in a really soft and pampered fashion so that they were old enough and fat enough they would cry more as they were tortured to death. And why did they want the children to cry more? So there'd be more tears to offer up to the demonic rain god in the hope of better rains. This had been a country where by the estimate of their own Aztec historians, the empire sacrificed one out of every five children. And where for at least one major festival, they were known to have sacrificed over 80,000 men just for one festival. 80,000 men to satisfy one of their demons. But although the conquistadores had stopped the human sacrifices, a great many of the natives had now been enslaved and forced to work in the mines. As a result, the Indians were beginning to resent the Spanish rulers even more than they had resented the Aztec rulers. The situation had grown so tense that a great uprising seemed imminent. And on top of this, the president of the governing council imprisoned anyone who dared to defend the rights of the Indians. It got to the point where priests were dragged from the pulpit and locked up for actually daring to criticize the situation. So the bishop, a Franciscan named Juan de Zumarraga, had some real problems. Not only was he responsible for God for protecting and converting the pagan Indians, he also had to care for all the souls of the Spanish, and that included the tyrannical rulers. But this was one bishop that didn't sit around and wring his hands and take public opinion polls. He was a real man. He prayed, and then he went out there and went to work. He infuriated the rulers by publicly preaching against them and their sinful abuses of power. But that wasn't having its desired effect. So in 1530, shortly after he had taken charge, he put Mexico City under interdict. What does that mean, to put Mexico City under interdict? It means he completely stopped the administration of the sacraments to the laity, except if they were actually dying. That finally got everyone's undivided attention. The king intervened, and basic rights were restored to the Indians. But the exploitation left its mark. Having encountered so many bad examples, it's not too surprising to learn that Indians were not particularly interested in converting to Catholicism. But the bishop placed the future of New Spain and the conversion of the Indians under the protection of Our Lady, and he asked her to acknowledge his prayer by sending him some roses from Castile. On Saturday, December 9, 1531, Juan Diego, that's St. Juan Diego, an Indian widower who was around 55 years old, is now living with his uncle, set out on a six-mile walk to go to Mass and attend catechism lessons. On the way, the path led over a hill called Tepayac. It's the highest hill right in the neighborhood of Mexico City. And as he walked up the hill, he heard the most beautiful music. It was birds singing in a way they had never heard before. When the music stopped, he heard a woman's voice calling his name in his native tongue. Juanito, my little Juan, my dear little Juan. He saw a glowing white cloud up in the neighborhood of the voice, and then suddenly he saw Our Lady standing in the midst of that cloud. Our Lady asked, Juanito, my son, where are you going? And he replied, My Holy One, my Lady, I am going to Mass and Catechism 
from the religious fathers who teach us. Our Lady said, My very dear son, you must know that I am the ever-Virgin Mary, mother of the true God, who is the author of life, the creator of all things, the Lord of heaven and earth, who is present everywhere. I desire that a church should be built here, in which, as your most merciful mother, I shall show my love and the compassion I feel for the natives and for those who love and seek me, for all who implore my protection, who call on me in their labors and afflictions, and which I shall hear their weeping and their supplications, that I may give them consolation and relief. Therefore, in order that my will may be accomplished, you must go to the city of Mexico and to the palace of the bishop who lives there to tell him that I have sent you and that I wish a church to be built in this place. Tell him all that you have seen and heard, and be assured that I will be most grateful and will reward you for doing all that I ask. St. Juan bowed and said he'd do as she asked, and he immediately set out for Mexico City. At the bishop's palace, the servants made him wait a good long time before admitting him in to see the bishop. The bishop patiently listened to St. Juan's story and then asked him to come again and talk about this another day. St. Juan left and went back to Payac almost at sunset, and he found Our Lady there waiting for him. He knelt down before her and begged her to send something more, someone that's more important and noble than him to get the job done. Our Lady smiled and told St. Juan to go back to the bishop in the morning and repeat his, her request. So in the morning, St. Juan went back. This time, it took hours and hours for St. Juan to be admitted to see the bishop. And in order to make sure it wasn't a deception of the demon, the bishop asked for a sign from Our Lady. St. Juan assured the bishop that Our Lady would give him whatever sign he wanted, and he struck out for the hill again. The bishop ordered two servants to tail St. Juan and see what he was up to, but when St. Juan got to the base of the hill, they suddenly lost track of him. They thought they had been made fools of by the Indian who ditched him, and they angrily returned to the bishop and suggested that he should be flogged if he ever dared to show up again. In the meantime, St. Juan found Our Lady waiting for him on the top of the hill. He told her that the bishop had his doubts and wanted a sign. Our Lady replied, So be it, my son. Return here tomorrow, and you will have the sign for the bishop. Then he will believe you. Be assured that I shall reward you for all you have done. Go now. Tomorrow I will be waiting here for you. St. Juan hurried home to find his uncle deathly ill with the typhus. His uncle asked St. Juan to bring a priest to hear his confession and give him the last rite. So very early on Tuesday morning, December 12th, St. Juan set out to get a priest. Since he had not yet fulfilled Our Lady's request, he decided to take a different path around the hill just to make sure he couldn't possibly bump into her. Even though he thought he could slip by without being seen by Our Lady, as he's picking his way a different way around the hill, he sees Our Lady descending down the hill, gliding right down to intercept him in his path. My dear little one, where are you going? What road is this you're taking? She asked. In his embarrassment, caught sneaking around the hill, St. Juan gave what for me is the classic response of a saint to Our Lady. God keep you, Lady. Did you sleep well? And how is your health? We can only imagine Our Lady smiling. And then, regaining his composure, St. Juan told Our Lady that he'd be back to carry out his command, her commands as soon as he found a priest to hear his uncle's confession and give him the last rites. Our Lady replied, Listen and let it penetrate your heart, my dear little son. Do not be troubled or weighted down with grief. Do not fear any illness or anxiety. Am I not here, I who am your mother? Are you not under my protection? Do I not hold you in the folds of my mantle? Is there anything else you need? Do not worry about your uncle's illness. At this very moment, he is cured. Now, my son, go to the top of the hill, and there you will find many flowers. Gather them together and bring them here to me. St. Juan hurried to the top of the hill and found all kinds of beautiful flowers, including Castilian roses in full blossom. He gathered as many of them as he could fit his outstretched tape, this, this cape, this thing called a tilma, and brought them to Our Lady, who then, just like a good mother, rearranged 
all the flowers and said, My little son, these roses are the sign which you are to take to the bishop. Tell him in my name that in these roses he will see my will and that he must fulfill it. She cautioned St. Juan not to allow anyone to see what he carried until he was in the presence of the bishop himself and then sent him on his way. St. Juan hurried to the bishop's palace and once more asked to see the bishop. The servants left him standing outside at the gate nearly the whole day. Late in the day, one of the servants tried to find out what St. Juan had bundled up in his cloak. St. Juan wouldn't answer. They caught a glimpse of the flowers and could scarcely believe what they saw, fresh roses in December. And stranger yet, when they tried to grab a few of them, the blossoms seemed to melt right into the fabric and somehow turned in embroidered roses every time they tried to grab at them. A servant rushed in to report all these oddities to the bishop, who up to this time had no idea that St. Juan had been waiting outside the whole day. The bishop ordered that St. Juan be brought in at once. St. Juan told the story of how he asked Our Lady for a sign, and he opened up his tilma, and out fell a bouquet of flowers and Castilian roses, the very sign the bishop had asked for in prayer. And, of course, on the tilma was this image. Everyone fell to their knees. And after some time, the bishop embraced St. Juan Diego and begged his forgiveness for not believing him sooner. They took the tilma and hung it in his chapel. St. Juan remained overnight as a bishop's honored guest. In the morning, he led the bishop to the hill and pointed out the exact place where Our Lady asked the chapel be built. He was anxious to see his uncle, and so the bishop appointed an honor guard to appoint, to accompany him on the way to his home. When he got there, he found his uncle in perfect health. St. Juan was excited and told the whole story to his uncle, who only interrupted once to find out when Our Lady had promised to cure him. When St. Juan was finished, his uncle had his own tale to tell. He said at the very same hour that Our Lady had promised St. Juan that she would cure his uncle, a brilliant light had filled their home, and Our Lady had appeared to him. Immediately, she healed him. She told him she wished to be known as Santa Maria de Guadalupe. Now, Guadalupe is an interesting word. In Spanish, Guadalupe is the name of a famous Marian shrine that goes back to ancient times in Spain. And as divine providence would have, in the language of the Aztecs, Guadalupe sounds just like the word which means she who will crush the serpent. So it meant something to both the Spaniards and the Indians. Within two weeks, a nice little chapel was built on Our Lady's site, and the day after Christmas, the sacred image was carried there in procession. It's quite a sight. The Spanish were excited, but the Indians were ecstatic, yelling out, The Virgin is one of us. Our Lady is one of us. In the excitement, some of them began shooting arrows all over the place into the air, and one struck another Indian in the neck and killed him instantly. It stopped the fun. They carried his body into the chapel and laid it at the feet of Our Lady, praying for a miracle. As they were praying, all of a sudden the dead man opened his eyes, sat up, got up completely healed. For the rest of his life, the grateful native swept the chapel floor and did other odd jobs around there to show his appreciation for the great mercy Our Lady had showed him. A little apartment was built next to the chapel, and that man and St. Juan Diego lived there. The Indian raised from the dead all these apparitions of Our Lady, and her miraculous image on the Telma made a huge impression on the Indians. The symbolism of the image was clear to them. The woman is eclipsing the sun, but adorned with the rays of the sun. That means she must be more powerful than their sun god. She's standing on the moon. So she's greater than the moon god. She's supported by an angel. So she's a heavenly being above the angelic spirits. The bluish-green veil color is a color reserved to the divinity, but her hands are joined in prayer, and her head and her eyes are lowered, which means she's not almighty. The white fur at the neck and the sleeves are symbols of royalty, as are the gold stars and the gold fringe. There's a small pendant on her neck, and on it, is a black cross, the symbol of the god of the Spanish Padres. She has a black sash tied on, which indicates that she's pregnant. When the Indians would ask, who is the child of so noble and great a mother, they found out the answer was our Lord and Redeemer Jesus Christ, 
who is not only the Son of the Blessed Virgin, but also the Son of the one true God. The effect of this on the Indians was absolutely incredible. By 1541, within 10 years of Our Lady's apparitions, there were roughly 10 million Indians who had been converted from paganism. 10 million pagans suddenly left lives of polygamy, doing kind of what you want, and idolatry, and came into the true church. And as we all know, there's a lot of rules. That's a Pentecost every day for 10 years. There's never been anything like this in history. Never. Father Torribio, one of the Indian missionaries in Mexico, wrote, quote, Had I not witnessed it with my own eyes, I should not venture to report it. I have to affirm that another priest and myself baptized in five days 14,200 and odd souls, close quote. In five days, more than 14,000 baptisms. The Indians would like, literally begging to become Catholic. As the Padres would get close to a village, they'd run out, kneel down, start making signs for pouring water on their head and so forth, begging them to baptize them and let them become Catholic. The tilma itself is made out of a rough woven magui fiber. That's a fabric which would ordinarily fall apart in 20 or 30 years. When I was a kid, that's what lariats, good lariats were made out of magui, and they don't last uh, 450 years, I guarantee it. They fall apart even in dry weather like Montana. Although it's 500 years old almost and hung completely uncovered for more than a century so that anybody that wanted to could come up and kiss it, touch it, touch things to it and so forth, the fabric has never deteriorated. As for the image, it's so thin that from the back you can actually see through it. As for the image itself, analysis by specialists of the Kodak Corporation in Mexico led them to conclude that the image is more like a color photograph than a painting or anything else. There have been many scientific studies of the Tilma to date. A recent study done by a biophysicist from the University of Florida concluded, quote, the original painting is miraculous, close quote. In recent decades, study of the image has revealed images right in Our Lady's pupils, San Juan Di- St. Juan Diego and the bishop, and at least one other man, are seen reflected in the pupils, just as they would be if you had a photograph of a regular eye. There's lots more, but we don't have time for it today. Not, surprising, not surprisingly, the demons inspired a plot to destroy the Tilma image of the one who had crushed the sermon. On November 14, 1921, during the height of the Masonic persecution, a time bomb was concealed in a flower vase that was placed right up on, uh, below the tilma on the high altar. The bomb went off right off schedule, right in the middle of high mass. Every stained glass window in the basilica was shattered, and chunks of marble were blasted right out of the sanctuary. The huge bronze crucifix, the altar crucifix, was curled up like a wood shaving. It's easy to see pictures of this thing. It just looks like something you you, you were whittling. It just curled right up. But no one was hurt at all, not even the priests and altar boys who were up on the altar at the time. There wasn't a mark on her, not even the glass in front of the image was scratched. Twenty-five popes have issued decrees about the holy image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Among other things, they've declared she's a patroness of Mexico and Latin America, and she's the empress of all the Americas. That means that she's our empress. She certainly is the patroness for all of us that are locked into this terrible battle with the principalities and the powers behind the culture of death, this neo-pagan revival that we're in. She's our empress. She's our patroness. And she's our mother. Any time we're having a rough time, we ought to meditate on those consoling words that she said. Do not be troubled or weighted down with grief. Do not fear any illness or anxiety. Am I not here, I, who am your mother? Are you not under my protection? Do I not hold you in the folds of my mantle? Is there anything else you need? Am I not here, I, who am your mother? Let's kneel down and close with Hail Mary, asking her to keep us safe in the folds of her mantle. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.